Hi, and welcome to week nine. This week, we're going to study speech recognition. And in order to understand how it works, we need to understand a little bit of what happens in your mouth when you're producing the sounds of human speech. And in order to do that, let me show you just how many things are moving when you speak. <laughs> All right, so as you can see, many things are moving. We call all these articulators. Two articulators are your lips. So when a sound occurs, that, when a sound is made with both of your lips, we call it bilabial, such as the M, B, and P in English, as in pa or boat or mom, for example. By the way, please follow along with the sounds and try to make them yourself so that you can experiment with the different positions in your mouth. So we have sounds that are bilabial. We have sounds that are a combination of your teeth and your lips, such as the F in English. Your upper teeth are in contact with your lower lip. We have sounds that are in this region called the alveolar region. If you put your tongue against your teeth and then move it up, you're going to find that there's like a little ridge that connects your gums to your teeth. That's called the alveoli. And this is the alveolar region. This is where your, the tip of your tongue goes when you say sounds like S or T in English. S, S for example. Uh, beyond the alveolar region, we have the softer palate, for example. Many sounds occur in the palatal region. For example, the Y in yes has the body of your tongue, um, the blade of your tongue, really, hidden the roof of your mouth. Yes. For the back, we have the velar region, where the body of your tongue touches the back of your mouth. The um, English has sounds like K and G that happen in this region. For example, cat, cat, cat. And for the back, we have the glottis, which is uh, the region where your vocal cords are. If you close your vocal cords, for example, you completely stop the flow of air. So this is the sound in the middle of oh, oh, for example. Nope. This is a map of the places of articulation of sounds of English, which again, or bilabial for sounds like P, B, and M, labiodental for a movement that involves your, both your teeth and your lips, like the F in fall. There's a position called interdental, which happens when your tongue is stuck between your teeth. For example, the theta in thought. There's the alveolar region, which has sounds in English like T, D, the S in sad, the N in nope, the R in red, and the esh in should, should. We have the palatal region, which has the first sound of the word yes. The velar region, which has sounds like K and G for cat and go. And this one's called engma. This is the last sound of the word sing, sing, which has the body of your tongue against the back of your mouth, the velum. Finally, English has glottal sounds like the H in happy, and the glottal stop in the middle of oh, oh. This table here is part of the International Phonetic Alphabet, which we use to describe the different sounds of spoken languages. So here on the columns, we have the places of articulation, we already mentioned bilabial for P, B, and M, labiodental for F, alveolar for T, N, R, S, S, for example. As you can see, there's other positions here. For example, not all T's are alveolar. Spanish has dental T's. Ta, te, ti, to, tu. Uh, where the tongue is in contact with the back of your teeth, not with the alveolar ridge. This position is called retroflex. In retroflex sounds, your, your tongue curls a little bit as it makes contact. Many languages from India have retroflex sounds. These are ta, da, na. For example, 
The palatal region includes the uh, first sound of the word yes. It also has this nasal here, which occurs in Spanish, Italian, French. This is nya, 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 nya. The velar region includes K and G. The uvular region is not used in English. Um, by the way, the uvula is the little dangling piece of flesh that you have uh, at the back of your mouth. But there are uvular sounds in languages like French, ra, and Arabic. Qaf, qaf, for example. Um, the pharyngeal region is used in Arabic. This one, for example, is ein. The, uh, the pharynx is here at the end of your mouth. And the glottal region includes sounds like ha. Uh, like the H in he, for example. So all of these words ha are different because the first sound varies in place of articulation. Pad, bad, tad, dad, cat. So this dimension is the place of articulation. This one is the manner of articulation. There are many ways in which the air can exit your mouth. For example, the first one is the plosive articulation or a stop. When you have a stop, you have a complete uh, closure of the airflow and then a sudden release, which might even be accompanied by a little explosion. For example, in telephone or uh, potato, potato or cat. If you put your mouth in front of uh, your hand in front of your mouth, as you say words like cat, telephone uh, and potato, you will feel the explosion of the release. There's other types of uh, manners of articulation. For example, in fricative sounds, the, um, the air canal is reduced. So you move your tongue uh, closer to the roof of your mouth, for example, and this creates a kind of turbulence. So the air that comes out comes rushing out through a narrow passage and becomes turbulent and essentially becomes a kind of noise. For example, the S is S, this one is SH, this one is F, and there's many others. For example, trill sounds are ones that have um, repetitive short mo motions. Spanish has this sound. This is RRRR, which is an alveolar trill. There's, uh, there's a special articulation called the nasal articulation. So there are some configurations of your mouth where the air can only exit through your mouth, like we have here on the left. But, but there is a part of your mouth called the velum, which can open so that some of the air rushes out through your nose. So here the air would have two exits, mouth and nose. These are sounds like M, N, and, and Engma, N. Um, you can put your mouth in front of your, uh, of your face and feel how some air escapes through your mouth when, mouth when you say sim, sin, sing, for example. One final distinction that we have in consonants is their voicing, whether they're voiced or voiceless. He, in many of these cells, we have two sounds, and the one on the left is voiceless and the one on the right is voiced. What does this mean? In voiced sounds, your vocal cords are vibrating. In voiceless sounds, your vocal cords are not vibrating. I'm going to show you very quickly what the vibration looks like. It, it looks slow, but this is because the it's so fast that the camera cannot capture it. The your cords are vibrating actually to some something like a hundred to two hundred times per second, and many sounds have a vibration of the vocal cords. For example, if you place um, your hand on your throat and say a word like "sue," "sue," the name "sue," you feel like there's no vibration. But if you say Z-O-O, -O, zoo, zoo, you feel that there is vibration. Please pause the video and try it out. Su, su, zoo, zoo. Pause. Thank you. And by the way, please 
try all of the previous combinations as well. The nasals, the, the positions of your mouth, and so forth. So, as you can see, there's several ways, uh, there's several dimensions that we can use to classify consonants by place of articulation, by labial, alveolar, velar. Um, we can classify them by manner of articulation, for example, stop of the air or fricative turbulence of the air. Some consonants are nasal, like N, and some consonants are oral, like T or an S, because the air only rushes out through your mouth. And some consonants are voiced, like a Z, or voiceless, like an S. And all of these are going to leave distinct imprints onto spectrograms. So, for example, with the fricatives, you can see here spectrograms for EFA, ETHA, ESSA, ESHA. And you can see that the energy is slightly different for each of them. In an ESH, we have more energy in the lower regions of the fricative. In the S, we have a more spread out distribution of the energy. In an F, we have higher distributions of energy. This is for fricatives. But, for, but something very interesting happens to stops. Stops don't have a duration. Because the air is completely stopped, no air is coming out, there's going to be no part of the spectrogram that corresponds to the stop. When you have an explosion, there's going to be a little bit for, for the rush of air, but there's really no part that you can tag and say, oh, this is a T, this is a D. The way we detect them is because of the influence they have on the vowels that follow them. These are examples of the vowel A uh, when it comes after a B of bad, a D of dad, and a G of gag. As you can see, the consonants don't really exist. There's just blank uh, nothingness here. But the echoes, the formants of the vowel, are, have slightly different shapes. For a bilabial, they have this upward swing and then they go down. Whereas for a velar, they have something called a velar pinch, where they like go like this, pinch up, and then expand again. So the, the stop consonants like B, like P, like K, like T, they don't really exist on their own, but they are going to have an influence on the following segments. And this is what the computer is going to have to learn. So you couldn't just have a computer learn, oh, this blank space is a T. No. In order for it to identify a T, it needs to identify it at the same time as it's identifying the A, for example. This is a very summarized version. This is a uh, the rest of the International Phonetic Alphabet. I wish we had time to look at more of it. There's consonants that involve not air going out, but air rushing in, for example. As you can see, there's many other details here. In the next video, we're going to take a brief look at the vowels. In summary, consonants can be described by their place of articulation, uh, bilabial, alveolar, velar, the manner of articulation, stop, fricative, trill, whether they're nasal or not, whether they're voiced or not. And each of these differences is going to leave an imprint onto the sound wave. Not, ne not necessarily its own duration in the sound wave, but it is going to leave an imprint onto neighboring segments. And it is all of this going on at the same time that we're going to have to get to the computer for it to learn that this vowel is really a consonant and a vowel. More about this in the next video.